All right, warm greetings from Princeton. My name is Tom Quirk, and on behalf of the Gilbert Lecture Series, welcome to this special live streaming event for a conversation between Andrea Goldsmith, Dean of Princeton School of Engineering and Applied Science, and Jose E. Feliciano, the great class of 1994, on the topics of innovation, entrepreneurship, and inclusion at Princeton. Um, before the program gets underway, I'd just like to review a couple of points. First, we're anticipating about a half an hour discussion between our speakers, after which we'll take questions from you. For that Q&A, however you're tuning into this live stream, you can get us your questions by typing them in the comments section at any time before or during the Q&A period, the earlier the better. Or if you prefer, you can send an email to gilbertlectures at princeton.edu. And thank you in advance for taking the opportunity to pose questions to our special guests. Now to introduce our speakers, I'd like to invite Professor Naveen Burma, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Director not only of Princeton's Keller Center for Innovation and Engineering Education, but also Director of the Program in Entrepreneurship and of the Program in Technology and Society and Associate Director of the Program in Robotics and Intelligent Systems. Professor Verma, thank you for introducing our special guests and I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, and hello uh, to everybody who's out there. Oh, um, I think you're uh, still muted. Can you hear me now, Tom? No. Oh no, you're good. Okay. Um, let me try that again. Um, so thanks a lot, Tom, and thanks for helping me through any technical issues that we might have had right off the bat. Um, it's really uh, a great pleasure uh, to be able to do the introduction for this particular Gilbert lecture. Um, and before doing that, I do want to just echo uh, what Tom said, which is a very, very warm welcome uh, to all of you out there. Um, of course, it's strange to be welcoming you in this way. I would hope to be able to do it in person. Um, and I'm sure it's strange for all of you um, and you're feeling missing out that you're missing out a little bit to not be able to be on campus. Um, but this is a great way for us to reach out to you. And I do wanna, I do wanna share with you, uh, I realize for many it's been a while since you've been on campus under the circumstances. Uh, this is really quite a unique and exciting time uh, around Princeton. Um, Princeton has always been a place that stimulates all of us um, in so many different ways, including through scholarship, including through the interactions that we're able to have with all of our colleagues. Um, and it's a place that represents such excellence and diversity and perspectives across disciplines from social sciences to humanities um, to the natural sciences and engineering. Um, but the really exciting and unique thing that's happened recently, um, it's happened for a long time, but it's something that's really picked up steam recently is the focus on how we can have impact uh, with that strength across the disciplines uh, on the world through innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and you know, it can certainly be argued, uh, and many of us believe so, that innovation and entrepreneurship is perhaps the single greatest way in which change is brought uh, into the world. And when you think of it that way, the people with, who are being impacted by uh, that innovation and entrepreneurship are such a diverse group. Uh, and so it's really essential um, to really think about diversity uh, and inclusivity as a first principle uh, when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, and the unique thing that we have today is two speakers uh, who have not only figured that out, but who have really integrated it into practice and into the thinking broadly of innovation and entrepreneurship. And so it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce this conversation that we're all gonna be able to be a part of between Jose Feliciano, class of 94, and Dean Andrea Goldsmith, uh, the current Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Jose Feliciano has thought very comprehensively uh, about innovation and entrepreneurship and the need for diversity in it. He's done that as the managing partner of Clear Lake Capital Group, uh, where he's led private investment in software and technology enabled services, industries, energy and consumers, but he's also thought deeply about it through his philanthropic activities. Uh, Jose and his wife, Kwanzaa Jones, have co-founded Supercharged Initiative, which is focused on key priorities in education, entrepreneurship, equal opportunity, and empowerment. He's on the board of directors of the Robert Toigo Foundation, 
where he's focused on nonprofit organization, which is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to fostering the career advancement and increasing leadership of underrepresented talent. Similarly, Dean Goldsmith has thought broadly about innovation, both in the professional society as the founding chair of the IEEE Board of Directors Committee on Diversity, Inclusion and Ethics. And she's also brought it to her own innovation and entrepreneurship activities as the founder of Plume Wi-Fi and then more recently Quantena. And so with that, it really is my pleasure to introduce these two uh, and to be able to be a part of the conversation between them. And so I'm gonna now turn it over to you, Andrea, uh, to start that conversation. Thank you so much, Naveen, for that wonderful introduction. And I'll reiterate, um, thank you so much, uh, Jose, for joining us. Uh, this conversation on a topic that I know we're both extremely passionate about, which is innovation, entrepreneurship, and inclusion. Um, the both of us uh, have have spent a lot of time uh, focused on innovation, entrepreneurship, and and seeing how diverse entrepreneurs and diverse people and diverse uh, voices around the table uh, lead to uh, innovation and impact that positively benefits the world. And that's one of the pillars that, that I hope to build up as uh, the new Dean of Engineering um, and Applied Science at Princeton. I'm not so new, it's exactly seven months that I've been part of this amazing university. And, and Naveen said that, you know, there's wonderful things going on campus. Uh, the Magnolias are blooming. So I thought I would celebrate that with my virtual background. Uh, but uh, this is an area in terms of growing innovation entrepreneurship. Uh, my aspiration is to make Princeton a catalyst for a diverse and inclusive tech hub. Uh, around Princeton and in New Jersey, uh, because I believe that it is those diverse entrepreneurs and innovators that can change the world in incredibly positive ways. So thank you so much um, for joining me in this conversation. And, uh, and our goal, of course, the reason we're doing this uh, in terms of uh, uh, serving as a catalyst is to have more positive impact in the spirit of Princeton's motto, which is to benefit humanity to benefit the nation, to benefit the world. And so um, I'd like to ask you, Jose, um, uh, you had a very interesting experience at Princeton as a diverse student. And I'd uh, like if you're willing to share your experience at Princeton uh, in this regard, what were some of the challenges you encountered arriving at Princeton? Sure. Uh, and thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Princeton and the Princeton community. Very excited to uh, be uh, here uh, virtually, uh, but uh, someday uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be on campus in real life. Um, yeah, so, so I went to, uh, I'm a class of 94. Um, I, my, my dad was an engineer, so I decided that I wanted to do engineering. And uh, through a fairly serendipitous uh, set of circumstances, you know, I ended up at Princeton. I had never visited the campus before uh, before attending, so so I showed up uh, for for orientation uh, for the first time uh, to to see the beautiful campus. Um, I would say that you know, obviously, I, I attribute you know my education to a lot of the success that I have been able to to achieve later in life. Um, but it, but I have to admit it, it was challenging, right? You know, I came from Puerto Rico, um, from a school that even though it was a good school, it didn't have the facilities or it didn't have all the perhaps you know, accommodations that you know a larger school might have. Uh, so there were some basics, even though I was very good, you know, for engineering. You know, clearly having some attitude for math and science is good. Um, but I had very little experience with, for example, a chemistry lab, you know, uh, where or physics labs, you know, so. So I think for me, it was, a, it was a very steep learning curve. You know, it was a time where I was not only adjusting to a different place, uh, clearly a different uh, language, or at least, you know, first language. Um, and obviously the types of adjustments that, you know, a lot of students have to go through, right? You know, when they, they leave uh, the nest of high school and, uh, and go to college. But, but I also had a very steep learning curve and a very steep um, uh, ad 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 adaptation curve, if you will, uh, to get up to speed, you know, and I think um, a few things, you know, made that possible. I think obviously Princeton has a great education, great caliber of not only professors, 
uh, but TAs and other facilities and other uh, resources, which I had to take advantage of. Uh, but it was, it was also my peers, right? You know, having, finding that place, you know, that sense of place, uh, that group of people that I was able to, to work with and study and, and go through uh, those late night sessions, you know, doing my whatever calculus homework. Um, and I think it was that combination, right? You know, the combination of the institution uh, and the people, not only kind of, you know, the, the professors and TAs, but also my, my fellow students, you know, I think that rounded up. Uh, I ended up, you know, kind of going through that very rapid curve. Uh, I, I would say by my second or third year, even though obviously the engineering courses become a little bit more difficult and the ability for students to to really experience everything that Princeton has to offer becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, but I, I, I think I, you know, I had a great experience and I'm very happy uh, that, that I did it. Thanks so much. You know, it's interesting. I'm seeing, I believe that's Santa Monica in the background of your window. And I, I grew up in, in LA in the San Fernando Valley and I went to a pretty awful high school as well. And I went into college also without uh, the same kind of preparation of, of my peers. And it was really hard to go in, not only not having that preparation, but also as a diverse engineer where people look at you and they think, well, maybe you don't belong and you don't have the right background and people think you don't belong. And, and I think there's a perseverance and a resilience that you build up by continuing. And, uh, and, and that serves you well later on, but we also lose a lot of students as a result. So yeah, it's, I mean, I'm so glad that you persevered and continued and, and, and got your degree in engineering from Princeton, but we lose so many along the way. And this is some of the things that I think we need to work on. Uh, we've actually introduced at Princeton a first year curriculum for students that come in perhaps without the same background as, as some of their peers to not only um, help them catch up, but also inspire them so that it's not just about fighting to survive, but really that they see if they can continue and be successful in this major and in this profession, that they can have a profound and positive impact on the world. And I think that is what builds up that resilience and perseverance that you see what's ahead, that you, that you can be successful and then have a lot of impact. So I know that um, uh, you've, there's other initiatives that we've started in addition to this first year curriculum. We have the Freshman Scholars Institute. We have the Scholars Institute Fellows Program. We have the McGraw Center to help our students um, uh, you know, uh, get through that early period uh, so that they can see the other side, that they can be successful and that the profession uh, needs them and can benefit from having them. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Jose, about um, the, the uh, generous gift that you've made you and your wife, Kwanzaa Jones, have uh, taken a step toward expanding the student body, uh, basically to aid Princeton in opening up and being able to make the opportunity of a Princeton education more accessible to diverse students. Can, can you tell me a little bit uh, or tell our audience a little bit about what inspired you to make that investment in Princeton? Yeah, I think, um, and you maybe touch on it uh, a little bit uh, indirectly. I think uh, uh, one of the ideas behind this clearly, you know, the GIF is very much in keeping and very consistent uh, with President Ice Gruber's, uh, you know, objective of expanding uh, the student body and 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 uh, allowing, uh, you know, kind of a a broader set of our population, you know students that are very well qualified, uh, that can certainly succeed not only at Princeton, but later on in life, but for whatever reason, maybe didn't have that access, right? You know, and I think obviously we have had a lot of discussion in the Princeton community about, you know, kind of uh, the socioeconomic diversity of the schools, not only, you know, kind of ethnic or gender diversity, but socioeconomic diversity as well. Um, so I think at, that the first layer of that give is, is allowing for that, right? You know, allowing for an expansion of the student body uh, and that expansion, I think with that expansion, we sincerely hope, and I think it's very consistent with uh, some of the initiatives that the president, uh, President Ice Gruber has uh, is undertaking. Uh, we're gonna see some of that socioeconomic, ethnic, gender diversity uh, follow. And, and we have seen, have seen that already uh, uh, recently in, in Princeton classes. And, and we, you know, Franz and I are very, excited uh, to see that. Um, the second thing, I think it, it touches very much on what you're talking about, right? You know, oftentimes 
that first semester or two, that first year uh, is very difficult for students that come from very different backgrounds. I mean, not now 20, 30, 50 people at Princeton already, you know, they may know nobody uh, perhaps, you know, uh, which was, I, I knew exactly one person, I think uh, uh, that was also in my, in my class. So, so part of what we're talking about here is, you know, oftentimes, uh, particularly uh, people coming from underrepresented groups, um, you have to believe it, you know, and, and part of that belief, you, you, and by that I mean you have to believe that you can succeed, and that part of that belief comes from seeing it, from seeing other examples, other role models, other people that have done that, have, that have achieved that, and oftentimes, you know, mentorship and, and direct contact and direct tutor, tutoring, those are very important, but oftentimes, it's my belief, uh, that even just having that role model, having that idea uh, that, that you can achieve that, that somebody that looks like you or that you for some reason identify with has been able to achieve something that you think it then becomes possible for you, that, that's very important. And when you walk our beautiful campus in Princeton, New Jersey, there's some beautiful buildings uh, and there are a lot of names in those buildings that you know are very famous people, uh, but very few of those names uh, have, you know, have names that sound like ours, right? You know, that sounds like uh, Feliciano or Kwanzaa. And, and I think part of our give is allowing for that, right? You know, if we can plant a seed uh, for some enterprising 17 or 18 year old that just is walking the campus for the first time, uh, that there is, there are buildings on campus that are named after people that look like them, that, that have, their same color, they have an accent uh, that, that, I, that they somehow can identify with them. My, my hope, our hope is that that, that will open up um, their, their minds, will open up their ambitions uh, to set very lofty goals. And, and I think, uh, you know, I think sometimes uh, I am concerned uh, that, you know, students come from underrepresented uh, backgrounds, they don't have the exposure to other industries and other people, and they don't set their sights high enough. And oftentimes they get discouraged because you get a bad grade on the first class or two, and you came from a background where you were getting all A's in the school, and you were the best student or one of the best students in that school, and you come to Princeton and all of a sudden you don't feel like you can compete. I don't think it's because of lack of talent or lack of intelligence. You know, I think there's sometimes different preparation and different backgrounds and, and a different adaptation curve. But I, I'm of a firm belief that, you know, intelligence and talent is fairly well evenly distributed in society. And our job, uh, my job, you know, as a business owner, but, you know, kind of hopefully Princeton's uh, mission's job is to tap into that talent, right? You know, to make sure that we are, fishing in the deepest pool possible and that we're not excluding any, any part of that, uh, of that pool of, of talent, if you will. Uh, and I think having more seats, you know, more an opportunity to have more students on campus coupled with, you know, a very um, active uh, agenda or active effort uh, to expand where we're fishing, you know, the, the pools that we are getting students from. Uh, and then if on top of that, you know, we can provide these students that are coming from underrepresented backgrounds with just the idea that, you know, success is possible, that, that, that there is so much more that they can achieve, uh, and that someday, you know, their name could be in a Princeton building and can make Princeton their own. I, I think we will have achieved a whole lot, and, and, and we will have been more than satisfied uh, that our give uh, has met its objective. You know, that's such a beautiful description. And, and I when I think about walking by the building that's going to be built and named for you in Kwanzaa, I will think of what you said, that this is a this is a stake in the ground about what diverse people can do and then give back to pay it forward to the next generation and encourage uh, our young people to to uh, to dream big and to not let others tell them that their aspirations are unwarranted. Uh, I, I think that that's one of the most important things uh, that we can do. You, you talk about role models. So you're a role model, Quant is a role model, your building will be a, a, a tribute to that. But we also need more faculty that are role models. We need more graduate students and postdocs so that their existence, um, just the fact that they are at Princeton and being successful and can serve as mentors and role models to the younger and next generation, I think is extremely important. 
Um, and I think the other uh, thing that we need to convey to these young people is that not only are they capable of success and that you know maybe they got to be in the class, but so did the non-diverse kids. It's just they don't talk about it and those people never question their ability. They get a B, they think it's the professor's fault. You know, <laughs> that, you know we gave them the wrong test. Whereas if you're a diverse person and you get a B, you think, okay, I'm not good enough. So how do we overcome that kind of doubt that these people have and that having those role models and existence proofs and people, diverse people that those students can look up to, I think is extremely important. Um, and we have to uh, not only bring in these diverse people, but make them successful. And to me, that's the root of diversity and inclusion. So when we talk about diversity, it's let's get these diverse students in. Uh, but inclusion is creating an environment for them where they feel they belong, they feel they can thrive, that they can make a big contribution. So I guess my next question to you, um, Jose, is you know, how do we enhance this in, in the STEM fields and in engineering where there are so few diverse engineers? Yeah. Um, well, I think you, you, you touched on a, on a few important topics there. You know, I think uh, I'll, I think that that, that 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 theme of belonging, right? You know, kind of it does start with making sure that you know, kind of if you got to Princeton, uh, it was for a reason, right? You know, and 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 you belong, right? You know, and Princeton is as much uh, you are as much a part of Princeton as Princeton is a part of you. But but I think we have to embrace that. You know, one of the things, and you know, I, I know there are you know many alumni. Uh, watching us today, and you know, many alumni of uh, underrepresented backgrounds, they graduate from Princeton, but they still feel sometimes that they didn't quite belong. And I think uh, part of the give and part of I think what we need to do going forward is that you know we are part of Princeton, and and we are contributing, and 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 Princeton is is you, and you are Princeton if if you got there. But going to engineering very specifically, um, the STEM fields are are tough uh, because obviously you are narrowing by definition, right? You know, you're narrowing a little bit uh, uh, your, your peer set. Um, and I do think that a lot of this has to do with uh, being able to have the right networks, right? You know, if you look at uh, success and there's you know, academic research on this front, right? You know, if you look at, you know, how you can succeed and, you know, what breeds su success, Oftentimes we're talking about networks and that applies to, you know, succeeding in school and applies to uh, entrepreneurship and applies to, you know, kind of a set of very successful companies that, you know, you see, for example, in places like Silicon Valley and other hubs of entrepreneurship. So, so I do think uh, that at core, there are many issues that, that, that are bundled here, but I think we need to do a better job of connecting these networks, connecting, you know, our students with each other, number one, and connecting those students with, you know, kind of the class that came before them and the class uh, above them and the seniors and, and then eventually alumni as well, right, you know, because I think that becomes then a virtuous uh, cycle uh, where those students, you know, feel more comfortable, they're collaborating, they're understanding, you know, kind of that they do belong, that they are smart enough, good enough, or better. <laughs> um, than the than the than the average uh, Princeton population, which is a pretty high bar to begin with, um, and that they can succeed, you know, kind of later on, and and also those networks then lead to opportunities, right? You know, summer jobs and and uh, internships and opportunities that again are the ones that allow for you to be in in the right place. You know, let's face it, right? You know, a lot of uh, success, you know, kind of is engendered or is generated. Uh, by also not only your own capabilities, and obviously a great education really helps, but also, the, you know, I, I would never underestimate the, the concept of those networks. And, I, and, 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 and again, you know, that, that applies to when you're in school networks, that informal knowledge and knowledge management, if you will, that comes with, you know, kind of being tapped in uh, to, to different groups, I think it's invaluable. And that's the piece that oftentimes is missing uh, and I know that, you know, that I struggled, you know, kind of when I was at Princeton, starting at Princeton to establish that. And once I did, I felt like I was able to flourish in a way that, I, you know, it was a little bit more difficult later. And I ended up, you know, graduating with, uh, you know, I guess high honors. Um, but the first year was tough. The first year, you know, kind of I had to grind more than I, th I think the average. And I felt that I, that, that I was less prepared in some respects than others. But, you know, eventually I cut up and hopefully, 
exceeded you know uh, the my, my average peer but but i think it starts with that concept of networks of people that you feel you can tap into for that informal knowledge that oftentimes is so crucial to success you know not only academically but also later on in the real world and i think that also really speaks to why it's important for us to diversify our community because often when you're trying to build those networks it's a lot easier to have a conversation with someone who looks like you or someone who's had a similar experience as you you know you end up you go to the same ethnic restaurant or you end up in you know so just somehow you connect with those people and you feel more comfortable with them because they're part of your your culture and heritage and and those networks are invaluable I mean I'm, I'm a two-time entrepreneur both of my companies came about through you know conversations with people in my network that you know, uh, I wasn't looking to start companies, but that's how it happened. And, and success often, uh, you know, or getting to the next level, whether it's a job or graduation or going on to graduate school or starting a company, um, really the networks that you have are invaluable. And then also when you run into challenges. So like I, I ran into challenges as an entrepreneur and, uh, and, and I had a network of people that I could uh, talk to and just say, you know, how, what do I do? How do I, how do I address, sorry, <laughs> sorry, there's background noise there. Um, anyway, I wanted, uh, Jose, uh, Jose, sorry, I keep using the Portuguese pronunciation, Jose. <laughs> um, could you tell me a little bit about your supercharged initiative and, and what that's doing? And then I'd like to spend the kind of the last few minutes that we have talking about entrepreneurship and building this ecosystem at Princeton. But before I do that, maybe you could tell us about your supercharged initiative and, and, and what you might share with our audience about how, how we work to support equity and entrepreneurship. Sure. Um, so as I think, uh, as Professor Naveen mentioned earlier, right, you know, the, the, the Super Search Initiative is focused on there are four pillars, you know, education, equity, uh, entrepreneurship, and empowerment. And I, we feel, you know, constantly I feel like those four uh, pillars, you know, have been instrumental in, you know, kind of some of the success uh, that came later. So we're trying to foment that, you know, we're doing that, Interestingly enough, it's not a foundation, so we're doing that. You know, there's a lot of what we do there that uh, we're supporting nonprofits uh, or educational institutions. Obviously, Princeton being uh, one of them. Uh, we have been very active, for example, at Bennett College, a historically black uh, college, you know, dedicated to uh, uh, female-only uh, education. Um, but a lot of what we have done as well is actually for profits, right? You know, we have basically supported. Uh, entrepreneurship, you know, in, in many different ways. You know, one of the things that I think is extremely helpful, and it goes back to the networks. You know, you may have a brilliant idea, but if you don't know how to finance it, how, you know, how to develop it, you're not going to be able to do that. So, one of the you know areas where we have focused quite a bit, for example, is in the access to capital uh, and the ability to to have uh, for people that look like us to have same type of access to capital that our companies might have. And that's where the next wave of hopefully very successful uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, will come. You know, for example, uh, one of the largest, you know, kind of black uh, owned venture capital firms just raised their second fund, Harlem Capital. And, you know, we have been supporters of their fund, for example, since the very beginning. So I think that that's, uh, you know, um, the digital divide, you know, we see COVID and the pandemic that we're still currently obviously suffering and hopefully uh, we are closer to the end or in the beginning of the end or something like that. But, but one of the things that that, ha that has highlighted right, is the inequities in many aspects of society, right? You know, in, in terms of inequities in healthcare, in the inequities in terms of the digital divide, right? You know, uh, something as simple as having a high speed access and a good computer or a good device to be able to uh, learn online uh, that we may, many of us take for granted is a real acute and you know kind of primary need for for kids uh, that live in, uh, in in lower socioeconomic uh, environments, so households. So so I think we're we're trying to help. So we wanted the initiative that we have worked there is trying to help uh, the digital divide, for example, here in Los Angeles in the LA County area. So so I think I would say you know we are very focused on those pillars. Um, we have a diverse set of initiatives. You know many of them again supporting everything from nonprofits. Uh, to support profits, everything that we do, we think about investing. We think about what is the return, not for us, but the return on that capital uh, to society. So it's kind of you know our own version of impact investing, uh, which basically combines you know kind of both for profits and not for profits initiatives that we think 
uh, are for the betterment uh, of society, which, you know, again, very much in keeping with our motto at Princeton. Yeah, that's that's wonderful, and it kind of uh, segue into to to the last thing I wanted to cover before we open up to Q and A, which is, you know, how Princeton can actually serve as a catalyst to build a diverse and inclusive tech hub. I think that you know many many universities have tried to mimic Stanford and build a a Silicon Valley around them, and as a two time entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, it's not a welcoming place to diverse entrepreneurs, and and I think as a result, it doesn't necessarily develop some technologies that can really have a positive impact on people on the world and, and also be successful technologies. I think that's our opportunity at Princeton is to build an ecosystem grounded in the motto of Princeton that you know we wanna build a diverse tech hub that builds technology that makes the world a better place. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not, uh, there's many challenges to doing that and I'm excited to embrace those challenges and to figure out how to get that vision uh, executed, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, um, what type of ecosystem uh, should Princeton build to support entrepreneurs and innovators, um, and and how do we uh, build that ecosystem? Yeah, well, I think um, I'm a big believer that you got to build on on the strengths that you have, right? You know, we're all unique as individuals, and and the same applies to institutions, right? You know, Princeton has some special things. Uh, that other great institutions um, don't have. Uh, you know, I went to Stanford Business School, for example, and you know, there's a fantastic technology hub uh, in Silicon Valley that you know has been powered or driven, you know, in some respects by by that institution. Uh, but I think Princeton, if you look at it, you know, has some great advantages, right? You know, today uh, you have a great institution where I think the statistic is, you know, you would you, you can tell me, but you know, 25 plus percent of students take at least one class in engineering, many of them uh, computer science. Um, Princeton has some very obvious in my mind, uh, centers of excellence, you know, for example, economics you know, has been a center of excellence for years and years. When you think about the intersection of technology and economics, think of FinTech, right? You know, one of the hottest areas in terms of investing and entrepreneurship right now is FinTech. Um, there's all kinds of innovation, you know, there's all kinds of inefficiencies about how the financial system works and how we access capital and how we do transactions. Um, and I think that intersection of, you know, kind of finance, economics and technology is something that, you know, Princeton is very well suited for. And by the way, a very significant part of, you know, that innovation in FinTech uh, goes to uh, providing access uh, to the financial system to people that didn't have that, right? You know, the, the, the so-called unbanked uh, population, which is huge, you know, not only in the U.S. but across the world. So, so for example, to me, that's an obvious area. You know, um, the, the the Princeton and the New Jersey area has always had a very strong healthcare, biotech, pharma uh, heritage, right? You know, and there again, you know, the concept of not only those uh, uh, you know those subsectors of healthcare, but healthcare IT is a very, very important area of innovation right now. And you know, again, a very large part of our economy uh, that is very inefficient is still fraught with uh, you know, paper-based systems uh, and other inefficiencies uh, that have been highlighted, by the way, uh, by you know, COVID and the pandemic, right? You know, and think of the acceleration of that innovation that has occurred, you know, kind of prior to COVID, uh, going to the doctor via Zoom was fairly rare, right? You know, now the concept of telehealth, you know, basically doing a Zoom with your doctor, it's kind of what you should do or what you probably do uh, rather than go to the doctor if it's something quick or something that can be done remotely. But but th that's just an example, right? You know, but again, the intersection of technology and healthcare, so-called healthcare IT is another, you know, kind of area that to me seems like an obvious place where Princeton can be highly, highly differentiated. Because again, what you want to build is an ecosystem that provides its own synergistic, you know, kind of uh, ability to cross pollinate ideas, right? You know, and, and and by that I mean, you know, that you are the proverbial entrepreneurs, uh, you know, kind of sitting in Starbucks, exchanging ideas, you know, they go on to to uh, to found or to start, you know, kind of the next whatever Googles or Teladocs or other things in, in, in the world. But I think 
obviously there are many more examples and it's a longer conversation but to me for example that intersection between healthcare and technology and you know economics finance and technology are two very obvious areas where princeton should have an advantage uh to many other uh, institutions i agree and it's it's also interesting that the tri-state area in new york city is you know becoming growing as as a tech hub and and also when you think about you know stanford business school Silicon Valley grew up long before Stanford had a business school. So it was really the, the vision, in fact, of Fred Terman, the, the, the dean at, at Stanford that decided that, you know, Stanford needed a connection to industry and he had to build the industry to make that connection. And I think we have absolutely that opportunity right now at Princeton. And going back to something you said earlier, which is that, you know, if we foster our diverse people to be entrepreneurs, they have experiences that will allow them to create companies that solve problems that people without those experiences don't even think of. So if you think about um, Black people's experiences or, or Latinos, they know things about their community and problems that need to be solved, and they can solve those problems as entrepreneurs. And, and the last uh, point I'll make oh, by the is way, that- and, and to add to that, it is well known, you know, and again, there's lots of academic research, but it's statistics that, you know, entrepreneurship in, for example, uh, Latino, Black, uh, and Asian uh, communities actually higher than in the general population. Actually, if you peel the onion, you know, the entrepreneurship levels uh, amongst, you know, Latinas and, you know, Black female entrepreneurs is actually extremely high. But then you're talking about, you know, kind of a, a few other uh, barriers, you know, access to capital being one of them, and the types of businesses that we're starting. But, the, but that entrepreneurial kind of uh, seed is there, you know, with the right education, with the right, you know, kind of fertile ground uh, and, and the right networks and access to capital. Uh, I think, for example, the tri-state area with such, you know, immense diversity in, the, in, in, in those states uh, is very well poised and very well uh, positioned uh, to take advantage of that and do that in a very inclusive uh, way that, you know, is bringing forward or is bringing, you know, kind of upwards all of our communities, you know, because I firmly believe, right, you know, that uh, you, you need to have uh, empowerment, you know, kind of in, in both social, political, and economic uh, realms, you know, and a lot of that driven by education uh, to truly be successful and be successful as a society. Absolutely. And the only other point I'll make, and then we'll open up to questions, is that Princeton is a liberal arts university that gives its students a broad liberal arts education. And I think that makes all our students, including our engineering students, better leaders. And therefore, they're going to be better at, at leading companies and leading new ventures. And I think that's very exciting uh, to me as, as uh, a secret sauce that we have in terms of fostering more entrepreneurs and innovators. So uh, with that, um, uh, thank you so much, Jose, for this amazing conversation. And now, we'll, uh, now I guess we'll let the audience uh, tap in and, and, and ask us some questions. And I think, Tom, uh, are you going to uh, moderate the questions here? Yes, here I am back again. Thanks to you both for the fantastic conversation we've had so far. I have a whole slew of questions for each of you. Um, <laughs> there's one though that seems like you both can comment on and it picks up right where your conversation left off. So if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna read this out for you. So it says that before the pandemic, when I imagined the kind of innovation ecosystem that might exist at Princeton, my thoughts went to partnerships with industries located in this region principally pharma, biotech, was geography ever a real limitation or is it just an advantage? If so, has the last year changed perceptions of that? Jose, you want to go first or do you want me to take a stab at that? <laughs> you can go first. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. Pop. So uh, as, I, as I think about fostering more entrepreneurship and innovation at Princeton, one of the pillars of my thought process is about place. Um, place does matter, physical place matters. I think the fact, what we've lost this last year of doing everything online, I don't think it's something we can truly understand until we go back to being in person because what we've lost is impromptu conversations, uh, networking outside of structured environments. Um, and so it does matter to be physically able to meet people uh, and to have groups of people talk to each other in unstructured ways. Uh, in that sense, Princeton is a wonderful place. Uh, when I look at it, I see perhaps what Terman saw at Stanford in the 1950s. We're surrounded by lots of cheap land uh, relative to other places. 
Uh, and we do have some very successful industries around Princeton. We have a fantastic university. And there's other universities that we can draw talent from too and companies that we build up around Princeton, you know, such as Rutgers and NJIT and, and other uh, companies. Then again, we can reach up to New York. We can reach down to Philly. We have the whole tri-state area where there's many, many opportunities to build companies. But I think what the pandemic and all online world has taught us is that place doesn't need to be in person all the time. And especially when we're thinking about networks, uh, we can draw from people all over the world to connect our entrepreneurs to investors, to angel investors, to uh, companies that can tell them, you know, this product, you're never going to sell it to us for the following reason. That happened to me in my first startup uh, when, when we wanted to sell our chips to Apple. And they said, we'll never put your chip as a startup in our phone because it's too risky. Great, we'll do something else then. You know, those conversations are invaluable and they don't all have to be in person. So I think that for Princeton to think about place, it needs to leverage where it is. It needs to leverage all of the strengths that Princeton has at Princeton within the university and around it. It needs to leverage where it is in the tri-state area, but it also needs to figure out how to take advantage of the virtual world that we've learned we can inhabit in ways we didn't think possible before the pandemic. Yeah. And I, I largely agree with that. You know, the only thing I would add is that, um, uh, so the office, what we used to call the office, we'll see how this develops, you know, but you know, maybe a gathering place where we come in uh, at some points in time to gather in person because that's important. But, uh, but that idea, right, you know, that you can operate in this hybrid environment where there's some people that are maybe physically together and others that are more uh, dispersed, uh, I think that that idea is here to stay. I think that's there's no question about that. Even though we're still kind of learning how we'll go back to work, uh, you know, post COVID. Uh, and the, and the second thing I think is you know kind of to to Andrew's point is you know that that Princeton is a place, a physical place. But you know I think the pandemic opens up our eyes, right? You know that Princeton is wherever there's a Princetonian. It's, it's, there's a little bit of Princeton, right? You know, and and we can collaborate and we can work together sometimes you know, in synchronicity and sometimes, you know, asynchronous in asynchronous ways. Um, but we can work together in different ways that we imagined possible even 12 months ago. So, so you know, obviously to, to the, the silver lining, I think of, of this pandemic is uh, that we have learned very, very quickly because we were forced to, uh, to think about, you know, place in a different way. Uh, and this idea, again, of a, of a hybrid work environment uh, I think it's, it's very much here to stay and it's going to be prevalent uh, in the future. And I think just to follow up on that hybrid work environment, what we don't know how to do is, is some people in person and some people remote. What we learned with the pandemic is that, okay, everybody went all remote completely. I think when we go back to being able to be in person, how do we integrate remote people? You know, if you, if we had technology to do a hologram, you know, to have the person sitting at the table, then, then, then it would be similar to being all in person. So there's still a lot of room for technology innovations to help us when we go back to normal, be able to have a broader perspective on place. But I don't think we've solved all those problems yet. And then also to your point about the digital divide, not everybody can participate in those hybrid and remote conversations and work environments. And, and that's something we also have to fix. Okay, Tom, next question. Okay, terrific. So uh, I've got another one about innovation ecosystems, uh, and then we can uh, switch topics. Uh, I'll have to paraphrase this one a bit. I think it's mostly for, for you, Andrea, but Jose, you may have some experience uh, observing innovation ecosystems and be able to, to weigh in. Um, when you build an innovation ecosystem, are you creating competition for the retention of talent? Um, or does it satisfy an urge among faculty? Uh, yeah, I think that's, that, that, that sums it up. So, I mean, it, it's a really interesting question. Uh, one of the things that surprised me about Princeton, and other, a number of things have surprised me coming in uh, as uh, someone who spent my whole life in California, um, is how entrepreneurial the Princeton faculty are. Uh, in fact, when I look at, uh, I've met with almost all the faculty one-on-one -on -one in engineering, and uh, when I look at the percentage that have founded companies, including very successful companies, it's about the same percentage as at Stanford. It's just we don't highlight that and we don't talk about it as much as we should, I think. So 
Princetonians, uh, at least the faculty and also the undergrads, um, have uh, an ecosystem now. Uh, I think what we need to do is build it in such a way that those companies can be more successful than they are, and also that we can keep some of them at Princeton or around Princeton. So when I think of why, why, do, why is one of my main goals to build this innovation ecosystem, um, it's a secondary issue to retain faculty. Uh, the primary reason is to have more impact. I mean, in order for Princeton to have the impact that it wants to have in engineering in particular and more broadly, we have to get our ideas out of the research labs out of the classrooms, out of the students' minds, and into technology and products and companies. And so the more successful we are in creating the platforms and the networks and the connections and the um, kind of greasing the skids for all of the people, all of the Princeton constituents to be able to take their ideas and build successful technology and products and maybe companies, it's fine if those ideas go into a big existing company as well. As long as we get those ideas into the world, we will be maximizing our impact. So from my perspective, the reason this is important for Princeton to do, and the reason that the leadership, you know, from Chris Eisgruber to Debbie Prentice and, and everybody at Princeton supports doing this is not so we can compete with Stanford for a faculty member who's entrepreneurial or a graduate student or an undergrad. It's so that Princeton can have more impact than it has right now. And that really speaks to me as an incredibly motivating reason to be successful at this. And uh, Jose, I'd love to get your perspective as well. The, the other thing I would add is that um, I think many engineers, you know, are inherently very creative, right? You know, the, the idea of engineering is precisely to, to create something, right? You know, to apply science uh, and other mathematical concepts and, and, and create something. So I think to me, the very idea of engineering has always been, has a very creative uh, underpinning to it. Uh, and what I think a real technology hub, what it does is that it accelerates the feedback group, right? You know, between creating those ideas, uh, having these you know, very innovative concepts that, that people come up with and applying them to the real world and then getting that feedback, right? You know, and, and continuing to play, applying that to your research and to the science. So, so to me, that's really the key um, to, to a true you know, kind of entrepreneurial and technology hub is the ability to have a much quicker feedback loop between ideas uh, and, you know, kind of real life experience and integrating those uh, and, and, and continuing that loop. Uh, so, so I think there again, you know, Princeton is uniquely positioned, I believe, in, in having a role there and creating that sort of, you know, kind of feedback loop. Um, but, but I think there's more to do and, and clearly. Yeah, and I think you make a really good point, uh, which is that that is often missed, which is that it's not just about getting our ideas into technology and products, but that experience really enriches uh, us as not only researchers, but also teachers. And I would say the two startups that I did, that experience, uh, what I brought back to my research and my teaching was something I never could have expected. It was it really broadened my perspective on on both research and teaching, and and that's also going to make Princeton a better university, I think, by having that feedback loop of our faculty and our students um, and our postdocs taking their ideas, going out, and then coming back and and bringing that experience with them. Tom, next question. All right, great. So next one's for you, Jose. Uh, could you speak a bit about uh, how you decided to start your own company and talk a little bit about some of the challenges uh, with establishing and growing your firm, maybe aside from the uh, financial crisis of 2008. Well, um, I'll keep it short, but, you know, I think uh, uh, maybe, just maybe I had you know, an entrepreneurial itch, you know, my, uh, for, for a long time, you know, so basically after uh, after Princeton, I took a little bit of detour. You know, I basically went to the world of finance, uh, went to Stanford Business School. I read it from Stanford, you know, in the in the late 90s, basically in the midst of, you know, kind of the first, depends how you can, but the first internet bubble. Uh, and I joined a very small startup. It had about 10 people. Uh, we grew to about 200 people, um, raised 
a lot of capital for from name investors. Um, unfortunately, uh, like many startups of that era, we didn't succeed. Uh, we actually had to essentially sell the company in a distressed situation. Um, but that was an incredible lesson. I right? you know, it was my second MBA, my 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 third degree, uh, if you will. Um, I learned a lot, you know, out of that experience. You know, I came back then to uh, a join a, a, a firm that was already established. But I think, I think deep <laughs> deep inside, I always had that urge uh, to start from scratch. You know, to create something uh, that was that I could mold, that I could really be a part of. Right. You know, so in 2006. Uh, when when I started Clear Lake with a few other folks, um, that was very much you know part of what we wanted to do, right? You know, we 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 saw an opportunity, like every good entrepreneur, we saw an opportunity to do something a little bit differently, and we had the the ambition and perhaps the naivete to think that we could that we could do something a little bit different. It hasn't been uh, a straight line. Uh, it hasn't been a the overnight success has uh, taken about 15 years, um, we had tough times, tough, very tough times. We started the firm in 2006, and as you kind of alluded to very quickly, uh, we hit some very choppy waters, you know, some very turbulent uh, times, you know, in, in, the, in the great recession of 08, 09, uh, but we survived, you know, and I think uh, with, you know, like many tough uh, experiences in life, right, you know, that kind of toughens you up and, and, and makes you kind of focus on the things that really, really matter. And in some respects, I actually attribute some of the success here at Clear Lake at our ability to, to do that. You know, so fast forward today, you know, we have a firm that has about $35 billion under management. Uh, we're the largest, you know, Latino-owned private equity firm uh, in the US. But most importantly, I'm, something I'm very proud of is that you know, by sticking to the core of what we set out to do 15 years ago, investing in specific sectors, technology, industrials, a little bit of consumer, uh, having certain flexibility, ability to do everything from a buyout of a large company to a carve out out of a bigger company to turnarounds and more complex special situations, and doing that, you know, by improving or, or in, in the midst of that, you know, trying to improve these and, and grow these companies. We have created, you know, a, a, a sustainable and replicable way of investing that has resulted in some really good performing funds. And, you know, this is where I'll lose a little bit of my modesty and say that, you know, we have had, you know, kind of top quartile or top decile funds for a very long time now, over a decade. And, and that is the core of we, what we set out to do. But there's a lot more to do. And this is a very competitive world. Uh, and there's challenges every single day. Uh, and I think we struggle in our industry with you know, diversity and inclusion as well, and how to basically take advantage of that pool of talent out there. Um, but anyway, I think at the core, it was that entrepreneurial kind of itch, if you will, or that entrepreneurial urge to create something from scratch uh, and to do it in a way that was a little bit different and a little bit better than what was uh, currently or the, that, that at that point existed. And, and, I, and that's, that ambition or that urge or that uh, passion is still what uh, drives me and, uh, and and my co-founder in terms of you know making this a better business. I was just going to make one comment tying into something you said earlier about diverse entrepreneurs being very successful. And it could be some of the resilience you need to build up because early on you face challenges uh, and, and you have to overcome them and you can't give up. And, and then I think when you hit the choppy waters later on, this is a... I've seen this before and I know I can get beyond it. And, and, and perhaps because all entrepreneurs hit choppy waters, there's very few stories where there's a straight line uh, from zero to you know, uh, success. And so I think that, that that resilience can often play a part. And I believe it probably played a part in your ability to overcome starting a fund right before a big economic downturn. Yeah, no, I think you're right. You know, I think, uh, I think you learn a lot more to this day. You know, I tell kind of the, uh, the folks that I work with is that you learn a lot more from the failures, right? You know, the successes, sometimes there's some luck involved and, and you, have, uh, you have to be careful not to extrapolate success because sometimes you just got lucky and, and, and certain circumstances, you know, led to that success. But the failures, you really can analyze and then try to dissect what, what went wrong. And, and that feeds into kind of that self-improvement and continuous improvement uh, type of feedback loop. But I think we wouldn't be here uh, in some respects, if it wasn't for my earlier 
failure, a very significant failure as a dot com entrepreneur. But uh, but I, I I do like success more than failure. But I think we you know we we fail every day in our business. We just try to learn from those failures, learn from those mistakes, and try to make our business better. Um, well, pick, picking question. up right on that uh, that uh, what you mentioned is the uh, entrepreneurial bug. Uh, question, another question for you, Jose. What aspect of your undergraduate experience do you think had been most instructive for cultivating innovation and that entrepreneurial spirit throughout your career? Yeah. Well, um, so what I do day to day is investing, right? You know, and, and investing, when you think about it, in some respects, it's very similar to the challenges or, or the issues that you tackle in engineering. It's not an exact science. You know, I never, there's no correct answer. So what I'm doing is I'm applying a framework. That framework is basically, uh, has been an educator, has been put, you know, I have built that over time. Um, it's a mix of judgment, intuition, analysis, and pattern recognition, right? And all those things, by the way, are the things that good engineers, you know, use uh, to, to tackle the next problem, right? And then you basically try to invest or to try to design if you're an engineer or engineer uh, with some room for error, right? You know, I never know what the right answer is, never. You know, when I value a company or try to buy a company and, and try to buy it for XYZ valuation, I never know if that's the right answer. I only know ex post facto, right? You know, after we sell it, whether or not we made money, whether or not we were successful. But what I try to do is, you know, kind of invest with a certain margin forever, right? You know, that, that you know, these three things could go wrong, but if these two other things go right, I'm going to succeed. I'm going to, I'm going to be successful. And I think that idea, you know, I think engineering and engineering education was an integral part of that idea. Uh, and, and to this day, I believe that, you know, kind of having that framework, that education, that background has helped me uh, in my day to day. Um, interestingly enough, by the way, you know, kind of it was very early going, but, you know, I was, I was one of the first recipients of the Princeton Entrepreneurial Program Certificate, which is something that, you know, kind of Professor Enoch Durbin, uh, may he rest in peace, you know, started in the 1990s at, at, at the Princeton Engineering School. So, so even back then, you know, kind of 25 years ago, it was the seeds of, you know, kind of how to combine, you know, kind of Princeton, the Princeton education, specifically engineering in that case with entrepre entrepreneurship. Just I'll, I'll, one thing I'll add is that in, in the um, competitions that we have in the Color Center, uh, just this year, the Engage Conference, we added a whole segment on social entrepreneurship and, and entrepreneurship, not around necessarily engineering, but outside of engineering. So I, I think that uh, I hope that we can cultivate entrepreneurship across all of Princeton, uh, but obviously engineering is a great source of, of, of ideas and creativity. Well, by the way, you know, like one of the, again, one of the very interesting areas right now is how to use, you know, AI, artificial intelligence, you know, and human behavior, right? You know, and, and obviously we are in a position today that we can aggregate massive amounts of data and, and that data, by the way, can be used like any good tool for, for good or for evil. Uh, and there are all kinds of issues obviously related to that intersection of technology and data and human behavior and artificial intelligence and inclusivity and diversity. Uh, how that you know data can be can be uh, can be used for for those purposes. So anyway, you know that, that that intersection of psychology, human behavior, data, technology is also a very interesting area right now. Tom, terrific. So let's try to squeeze in one last question here. Um, so Andrew, you mentioned uh, an initiative uh, that was launched recently. Are there other curricular innovations? underway to encourage undergrads to think more creatively uh, about innovation and technology uh, that maybe have arisen as a result of this COVID period and, 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 and preparing for post-COVID life? Uh, so, I mean, there's, uh, in, in terms of initiatives, one of the things that I think we want to do better uh, at Princeton and coming out of the Keller Center is design. So, so design is a process that brings in creativity and knowledge 
uh, to solve a particular problem. And I think that we are looking to develop some more curricular ideas there. I think the pandemic, you know, in terms of curriculum around uh, learning from the pandemic, uh, I, I think it's too early for us to say, you know, what are the fundamentals uh, that we're going to take out of this period. It's going to be a, a transition, as I said, a transition back where we're going to learn as much going kind of back to whatever normal looks like. We're not going back to the past, right? This is an inflection point in, in history and time. And so I, I wouldn't say that we're developing new curricula about, you know, based on, on the pandemic, but I think we will think differently about so many different things. And a university is a wonderful institution to be able to take the long view and say, we don't need to decide next year how we change the curriculum based on what we learned. I think it's going to be an evolution over time. I, I think it will infuse everything that we do as educators and as researchers, what we learned over this period. Uh, but we have to take those lessons uh, fully. And I think it's too soon to say what those lessons are. I'd love to hear, Jose, if you have any other thoughts about that. I think it's still early, uh, you know, to to really ascertain, you know, kind of what what how this may or may not affect the curriculum. I think um, it's a part of the conversation we haven't touched, you know, but I think it does highlight um, the ability of institutions to, like Princeton to have a further reach, right? You know, and that's a that's really a, quite a broader question for for educational institutions in general, right? You know, how do we exploit you know kind of all this knowledge institutional knowledge or this uh, uh this talent uh and, and are there more innovative ways right you know kind of uh, of helping humanity again you know kind of consistent with our motto um in a virtual world right you know and i, and I think there's some very interesting ramifications of that for for institutions but obviously we have to be realistic at you know that that's happening in the context of uh of an institution that you know has budgets and 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 other things you know that that we need to uh, to take into account, but but I, I but I think you know I'm I'm fascinated by the idea right you know that educational institutions particularly elite educa education institutions like Princeton have so much to offer to to the world um, and technology has the potential to enable that in a way that was not even imaginable. Uh, 10 years ago. And I think we need to explore that as a university uh, more aggressively. But, uh, but I think that's something that's in common with many other uh, educational institutions. Yeah, I also, um, elite institutions like Princeton are in a fortunate position. I think there's going to be a big shakeup of, of higher education as a result of the pandemic. And then there's also this whole repository that we have developed over this past year. I mean, every course taught around the world is recorded on Zoom. Uh, you know, we have knowledge about how students react to online teaching and learning and office hours and labs. It doesn't mean that our residential gem of an education shouldn't continue, but we should take some lessons learned from this period and say, you know, maybe we have more to offer other people without doing anything more than what we already did. And maybe there's lessons learned for our own students to help them learn better as well. Uh, so I think that's that that's what one of the things that you know the silver lining of the pandemic is it forced us into this worldwide experiment that none of us ever envisioned nor would have chosen to do and yet it, we would be losing a huge opportunity to not exploit the fact that this happened and take lessons away from it and enrich our education our outreach um, and and everything we do to have more impact Okay, Tom, uh, is there anything, uh, I think this uh, was the last question, we're already a couple minutes over. Uh, so I guess I will wrap up. I will thank you, Jose. It was wonderful, just really delightful to have this conversation with you. I think we could have gone on for hours. You know, uh, Thank you so much for, for participating. Thanks to everyone in the audience for, for your attention. And uh, sorry that we weren't able to get to all of your questions, but we really appreciate your participation. And we hope to see you in person uh, as soon as it's possible, at least those of you that, uh, that can come to campus and, and maybe we'll come to you in a virtual world uh, in some other way in the future. So thank you again. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. My name is Sabrina King 
and I've been working at Princeton for 15 years. I am a 2001 graduate of Princeton. Every year that I spend at Princeton, you realize the depth of 